Hello and welcome to Story Untold. I'm Martin Bauman and my guest today is a prolific athlete, a cancer survivor, an artist, and just a really nice guy. Josh Cassidy is a three-time Canadian Paralympian, a Canadian record holder, and former world record holder in wheelchair racing. And he's done it all after being born with doctors unsure of whether he'd survive his earliest years. His perspective on all that he's been through since then is pretty incredible. Here's his story. Josh, you're a Paralympic athlete, a motivational speaker, a cancer survivor, an illustrator, an artist. Tell me, first of all, how you got into wheelchair racing and what motivated you to choose that as something that you devoted so much time to? Hmm. Uh, Well, I always loved sports as a kid, and wheelchair racing was an opportunity in high school. Being in a wheelchair, I didn't always have the opportunity to compete in extracurricular sports until it was brought to my attention that track and field team had a had a wheelchair race event on. So that was my first try at it, and exposure during the 2000 Sydney Olympic Games was watching Canadian Jeff Adams do really well and and win medals there. So that piqued my interest and got me uh, into it. How long was it between seeing Jeff at those Olympics and you getting on a track somewhere? Uh, That 2000 year, I would have been in grade 10, and that would have been the first year I think we rented a racing chair for those uh, track and field championships, and then I think it was 16 when I got my own first racing chair. You became a cancer survivor at an age that most people are barely learning to walk, learning to toilet train themselves, learning to talk, all these things uh, very early on. Can you tell me what exactly neuroblastoma is, what it does to the body, how it affected you so early on? Mm -hmm. Well, mine was pretty much straight from birth, and so it was in my spine and abdomen, and that affected my spinal cord. So by the time it had spread quick enough, it had left my legs partially paralyzed. Very fortunate to be here, but, you know, it just... uh, the damage that it had done at that point, that's, that's the effect where it had left me. Do you have an idea from speaking to your parents and what they told you about the, what the doctors were telling them at the time, how slim those odds of survival or recovery were? I think it was just over a 50% chance at the time. So it was very scary for my parents, you know, firstborn, son, new parents, you know, I can't even imagine now as an adult what that have uh, been like going through with your with your own kid. You know, obviously I don't com- completely remember it all. I was just born, but the I have a really good memory in the first 6-7 years of my life were surgeries, operations, lots of hospital staying and visits. So I learned at a very early age about a lot of tough obstacles in life. Yeah. How old were you when you got your first wheelchair then? Uh, Well, they make them much smaller now, but I think I was five years old when I got my first chair. And um, before then, we actually had someone makeshift sort of a board with wheels for me to sit on and get around in at an early age I I would have been about three I believe three or four and um, so yeah so I used it to get around and it was always just from the from the get-go it was just learning about how to adapt I wanted to move from A to B figure out how to do it and it just forced me to be innovative with a lot of things at an early age. I mean so this has been your reality your entire life to have that experience Uh, what was it like for you at that age, then going to school, being around uh, your peers, uh, what what that was like? Uh, well, different ages, different schools. It was always really different. Right away at an early age, you know, kids are very honest, you know. They might ask, they might not. doesn't really matter. You've got some in common. you got the same toy or the same T-shirt. You know, you both wear Ninja Turtles and your best friends and, and leave it at that. But then when you get to a certain age, like I found, you know, starting around... 10, 11, and depending on the school too, every school, because my dad was in the military, so we moved around a lot, but depending on the school too, you know, there would be kids that would just, you know, there was years that I would have uh, bullying or teasing and that kind of stuff, and, and, you know, just, you know, other kids really not understanding and and who knows at that age whether it's an attention thing or what it is, but obviously at an early age that that has an impact on you too and how you deal with things. Right, because before that, I mean, I think there's a certain age of kids when you're four or five years old, you're just genuinely curious. You yeah. see somebody and you want to know, hey, what's that like? Or let me try that wheelchair out yeah. and yeah. they want to they yeah. see what it's like for themselves. Yeah. 
Uh, you mentioned you being a military kid. Uh, tell me about the places that you moved from, you know, point A to point B, uh, sort of your journey as the years went on. Sure. Well, I was born in Ottawa, and then my dad was in the military, so we moved, I think it was eight times in about nine years. So Ottawa, Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, Cold Lake, Alberta, Bagotville, Quebec, Trenton, Ontario, back to Moose Jaw, Port of Prairie, Manitoba, before my dad left and we settled on a farm two hours north of, of Toronto. So from that point on, then it was from military to uh, farm life. So so that at that early age, it was uh, it was an adventure at that age. I, I can imagine getting older, you know, how that would be quite tough moving around, but, uh, you know, definitely exposed us to a lot parents were able to sell it to you as a chance to travel around and see the country yeah it was and it was an adventure and and you know i i loved you know the jets and and the flying and and the adventure and and all that and some of the moves were a little bit tough too but um but yeah no it was a great great experience at an early age what was farm life like did you have animals on the farm or is it the crops what what do they uh, do in there yeah, the, there was a bit of everything. Um, it was tough, and and I think it was uh, it was the dream, and you know the dream turned out to be a lot tougher than I think my parents thought and everyone thought, and and at the same time too, we were. I'm the oldest of ten kids, so ten kids gets to be uh, quite a bit. So I mean, again, though, it was uh, great lessons, uh, learning to to work hard and work with our hands, and you know, great being out in the country, and yeah, so went from military to farm and then eventually like city for school and so it was a good a good cross-section of exposure in my growing up years <laughs> as you're growing up and you go past you know stage of maybe the childhood in the sense of, of kids being just curious and making friends right away to kids going through their own insecurities in picking out on other people's insecurities what was that process like for you as far as sort of a thickening of your skin or or just of learning to be comfortable in your own skin yeah it was it was tough I remember there was times that you know I think the first times I was exposed to it was you know maybe I might have been about eight years old or nine and you know it felt unfair it felt you know I didn't deserve this I didn't do anything wrong but I think I was lucky to have a good sense of understanding and and almost compassion or it was almost pity or compassion that they just didn't understand and I was pretty I think uh, mature for my years and very fortunate for for my parents and and grandparents and and the home life that I was brought up in which you know in a family of 10 kids are all just treated the same obviously I had some more attention for hospital trips and things like that but I had my own responsibilities and and so that 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 confidence in myself and the confidence from the things I knew I could do I just had to hold on to that and stick through that and then eventually it it saw me through when I was in high school it actually it it lessened a lot I didn't really have to deal with anything and I think it was just a maturity level you know I I hung out with kids older because they didn't care they kind of had a a more adult perspective on you know well (laughs) it's just really just it's not focusing on something that doesn't really matter too much right so you mentioned being a big sports guy. When did you actually start getting into playing sports? Uh, was there something before wheelchair racing for you? Hockey, I believe, was my first word. And I loved playing hockey. Me and my brothers on the military bases, we'd be on the street playing road hockey all the time with other kids. So it was it was playing goaltender. I learned how to play on my knees. And uh, Patrick Wall was my favorite player. Um, and his his lessons of passion and dedication and hard work were all things that really resonated with me and then on the technical side like you know he was always in the butterfly the the v go down so i just sort of learned how to perfect that on my knees and again it's like an adaption thing so i just uh, you know i learned to to get to get pretty quick and um yeah i loved it hockey was my my first sport love take me to the moment grade 10 shortly after that uh, olympic games you try out wheelchair racing, the moment and the feeling of flying down a track. Mm-hmm. I can remember in high school when I got my first racing chair that was set straight and, and how much of a difference that took off for my times. And then past that, I mean, it's all just a blur. I, I you know, I've loved moving fast, the idea of pushing yourself harder, those first 
races in packs that that still are exciting for me and get my adrenaline going and they're lots of fun the strategy and, and tactics involved there and and then the adrenaline rush and excitement of performing in front of you know 90,000 people in a in a stadium it's been really good to me and it's 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 still exciting so before you get this this specialized wheelchair for racing, are you just using a conventional wheelchair and, and trying to give it on that? Yeah, my first my first few ones it was just in my everyday chair, and it was you know talk about thickening skin like it. I was lined up. I remember at my first regionals in high school, and there were these other guys in racing chairs, and I was just in this one, and it was like, geez, how can I even have a chance? But you know, there were guys that were way ahead and and I had no chance at and then there was guys in racing wheelchairs that I still beat in my everyday chair and I think that in itself is just I mean I guess it's a bit of a a reflection of me and who I am too it's I've always just you know I'll go and and I'll do my best and I'll give everything I can and even if I'm not at the top you know I gotta be proud for what I've accomplished and it's usually there's always stuff that we can all all still look at and and we should look at those positive things and the things that we should give ourselves credit for to build confidence and grow how bad are those blisters on your hands or what what do you immediately notice as you're racing uh where does it hurt the first place (laughs) um when you're starting i guess it would be hands to start but the lower back is probably the worst because we're just in this really punched over aerodynamic position so it's definitely not comfortable and you're and you're squeezed into this tight chair because it's built for aerodynamics and so it's quite tough, but it engages everything. It, you know, it's it's chest, it's shoulders, it's back, it's core, it's it's everything. So it's a pretty extensive workout. Where do you go from doing a race? I mean, I imagine your earlier races are not long distance. You're probably doing something shorter to deciding I want to do a marathon and I want to <laughs> I want to do this for you know 42 kilometers. Uh, it's a big difference. Yeah, it was just basically the big boys were doing it, so I wanted to do it too, right? I think that was most of it. It was, you know, it's always just been for me. If I see someone else doing something that I thought was cool or I wanted to do, I would just go for it and go do it. And that's the same that it was for that too. And and it's it's kind of a testament with a lot of things in life and what we what we limit ourselves with our abilities and it's amazing you know when someone beats a world record like Usain Bolt you know and now there's a ton of guys that are passing what was the past world record right and so much of that is just that mental you know breaking through that mental barrier of seeing somebody else do something and then us believing in ourselves that we can do it and and then the same goes with our ourselves too and that goes the same with obstacles and things that we go through it's like as soon as we get through something tough once you know that that should instill confidence in you that hey if this thing pops up again i can do it and that's the aspect of sport that i always just love that challenge to grow more in the marathon was just another a bigger challenge to to go after You know, what you've just been saying there kind of reminds me, were there things that people were telling you along the way uh, that you'll never be able to do this and Mm -hmm. things that you said, watch me and tell me about that? Oh, totally. Yeah. Uh, And it still happens. I get told often, you know, there's there's people that will always doubt us. So I remember being in high school and I remember a, a girlfriend's brother saying, like, he's too small. There's no way he'll he'll ever be fast enough or or whatever or strong enough and you know here i am one of actually the biggest guys and my my size and power is my detriment actually where i would be better off if i had less uh, less mass to me but it never stops i mean there's you know i've done fairly well and accomplished some pretty big things and even at that there's still people no names but that'll say you can't do that or you know like you're unable to do that or you did that once and you can't do it again and but you know what it's nothing old for me so it's just something I I take as a little bit of fuel put in my pocket but but not let it take over or bring bring me down though either being born and having that 50 50 am I going to live am I going to die right from the start Mm -hmm. to have that perspective now do you have a an extra appreciation for just the opportunities that you've had in in being (laughs) on the other side of that 50 percent yeah well you know those early years of all of our lives are so formative so for me having the first five years which they say you know the first five years are so crucial being constantly in hospitals being constantly in physical pain and i remember i remember i have memories of three years old that i remember and two years old and clear as day still they're very formative so having those 
things shape me. It gave me perspective on life, on health, being appreciative at an early age for, for life, being stuck in a hospital for so many years, to be able to get out of the hospital after spending so many years to get to and, and just have this desire to do what I want to do in the world after being behind the walls of the hospital or or appreciation for health, knowing what pain is, knowing what bad health feels like, knowing what getting pumped with antibiotics or like even the chemo. I don't remember the chemo, but I've just always had this push away from don't take drugs unless it's the last resort work on eating right the supplementation first the mental uh, health component first the physical component of staying healthy first and then you know we're so blessed to have the medicine that we have but to not use it as the first thing but to use it as the last thing and and you know that being sick for such a long time at an early age obviously had a huge part in me wanting to just be healthy and take care of the parts of my body that work the most to be able to be at my my optimum for them. I think a lot of us tend to take that for granted that that health aspect and when it's taken from you or when you're suddenly sick or whether you're put in the hospital or you're out of commission for a week or a couple of days you you realize just how much we come to rely on it. Mm-hmm. What do you remember from those times when you're 2 or 3 years old and you're in and out of the hospital or you're you're confined to a hospital bed? Mm-hmm. Well, it's a it's a, a mixed bag. Like I have good memories and bad memories. The the tough ones are are you know the hospital ones often, and you know my mom being in waiting rooms. We spent so much time in waiting rooms, and her just you know being so great and us playing I Spy games or, or things like that, just to try and get the boredom to go. And and it was just like itching to go and do anything any kid would want to do: go play, right? Have some fun. I can remember you know being on the hospital bed getting pushed in for my surgery i remember holding my three or four years old holding my ernie and bert under my arm and asking them to not take it away until i was asleep and them Mm -hmm. taking it away right away asking them if they could not put in the needles till i'm asleep and then doing the needles having the gas mask with these bright lights you know over my my face and three or four years old it's uh kind of scary you know but at, at the same time again like being through such scary things at an early age too i'm fortunate that rather than it crippling me (laughs) odd choice of words to to be a fearful person i think it it took away a lot of fear at an early age getting through them and being on the other side of those and focusing on that aspect instead but yeah because of the early memories i'm blessed with so many good ones at home grandparents parents memories playing with my brothers that uh i'm blessed to to have those did you mention how common your type of neuroblastoma is? Like how many in 100 people would have or how many in 1,000 or, or plus? I don't know what the stat is right now. I know it's very rare <laughs> and, you know, very rare to, to survive it as well. And, you know, I've met with lots of parents since with kids who have had it as well, and, and they're starting to get more information, but it's still something that needs to be conquered. It's taking the lives of, of a lot of innocent kids. It's just heartbreaking. So it's, you know, a passion of mine to create awareness, and, and I've been involved with some fundraising things for it as well because... Yeah, it's uh, obviously hits home for me. There was a little girl that became really close to you in England. Tell me about getting to know her and the mark that she's left on you in in her short years. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, yeah, one of those things where it's just such a small window to make such a huge impact. I was going through the toughest stage of my life that I phase I've been going through it was just everything was going wrong I had just gotten to Australia my grandmother wasn't doing well with her health and I just gotten there and she was apparently on her deathbed and she ended up making it through but uh, my own health there was some team stuff going on equipment problems there was training stuff um, financial problems you know family stuff it was just like everything on the list and when we get in those downward spirals you know it's just it's hard to see light in it and and literally every single area in my life I was dealing with something so I knew I had to practice what I preached and if I worked hard and put my head down I'd, I'd get out of it and what really got me out of it though was being contacted by this this young four-year-old's parents who had uh, just reached out to me and were following me and because of having neuroblastoma as well and they said lots of kind things and they told me about their daughter and, and her situation and how slim her chances were she hadn't passed her first the first 
treatment that she got wasn't successful. So they needed to raise something like f- over 400,000 pounds to get her next treatment. So it's funny, whenever you were so focused on ourselves, it's coming out of that, that ourselves that there's always somebody else that's going through something more, some, something more difficult. And so I decided that I wanted to start training for her, do these races for her, use my exposure f- winning the races to, to have her at the finish line and, and be able to use my interview time to promote her charity. And, and that just catapulted my, my motivation for training and, and all those other problems just disappeared. So I ended up winning the Boston Marathon a month and a half later after a month and a half of, of a pretty rough time and then got to London and then she was sick. She had pneumonia, obviously low immune system, so we went straight up to the hospital to see her. They weren't going to be able to make it to the race. And long story short, it took over and she passed away a couple of weeks later. And, you know, it's... Uh, she's someone I still think about all the time. I talk to her parents often and, and, and keep in touch with them. And what really hit home through that short window was even just on the outside seeing how many people she had touched just this little four-year-old going through this horrible illness and she was inspiring hundreds of people thousands of people actually on twitter it was hundreds of thousands i think when they were doing the fundraising to to try and get money for her second treatment so again it's like what drives home with this a story and situation like that is no matter what we're going through you know you have a little child who's still smiling at the end of the day and bringing light to so many people and this is like the paraphrased version of you know so many other cool things that went on with her story and and before and after she passed but her parents are still doing the charity in her name and her next step it was called Neve's next step and so rather than the charity being for her next step of survival her next step was from above still playing a role in raising funds to help other kids so they don't have to have the same fate and um it's if, if a little four-year-old or five-year-old can inspire that many people and make a difference, we all have this ability in ourselves, and, and, and that's, for me, what, what sticks with me. You mentioned before, being a, a high school kid, watching those 2000 Olympics in Sydney. Mm-hmm. Fast forward eight years, Beijing, and you get to fulfill a dream that so many Canadians have, so many people around the world have, in being able to represent their country. Mm-hmm. Tell me about that moment of putting on the Canadian flag, the red and white, and being in that kind of environment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was such a, an incredible moment. Getting my first Team Canada uniform, seeing the torch. Seeing the torch was something that lit was something that I wasn't expecting to be, something that would move me as much as it did, but uh, it really did. And, and yeah, just being there on the first games is, is something that, that I was, you know, just extremely proud of and motivated me instantly for for the next ones that I was just it's always been the thing with me is what what's the next thing and yeah incredible moment as far as Beijing goes was it purely tunnel vision I'm I'm focusing on my races do you have time to watch other people in competing uh what did you end up seeing as far as ceremonies or or other different events None of the games, I don't think I have seen another sporting event because it's just <laughs> been so busy. I've done the 800, 1500, 5000 meter, and those are prelim semis and finals, and then the marathon um, in one as well. So it keeps the schedule tight, but Beijing, I went to the opening ceremonies, first games, and I, and I had to. It was pretty incredible. And getting in the stadium for the first time was something I had wanted to do. And, um, and that was in the, that's in the bird's nest, right? That's right, yeah, bird's nest. And and yeah, I'll never forget that. And and I had just I had pre visualized that moment so much that my nerves two days before were just going, but it was adrenaline. Like I wasn't scared, but it was just draining me because I was just so excited to race and get out there. And it wasn't until I got on that track for the first time that I actually just calmed down because I'd just been waiting for that so much and I'd seen it in my head and that's where I felt comfortable and where I was supposed to be. And um uh, yeah, it's funny though how it changed from games to games. The next games you know, London 2012, I was there on a mission. I was there to do stuff. I probably could have soaked it in a bit more too, but I was there for 
a mission and it, and it became then the opposite to a learning of you know knowing that all these eyes are on you knowing how much support there is at home sponsors to support parents and family and friends and that was a learning thing for me letting all of that go <laughs> to take the pressure off and just focus on what I need to for myself another London moment for you 2010 tell me about that marathon and the the day of that race yeah, that one. So the London was then two. So two years after Beijing, that was the first race that marked my the first time I beat everyone in the world for the first time. I had beaten guys in that race that I hadn't never beaten before, and it was a rainy day. And I had gotten to London two weeks before to get ready for the rain. It didn't rain once in two weeks, and then rained on that day. And I wasn't sure how how it was going to go. I mean, I was was confident and was just ready to give my best. And it seemed like my my top races that was sort of the approach that I had. It was a calm confidence that I've done all I can. I'm going to give my best without a humongous pressure on myself. So when I crossed that line, I was pretty excited and, and happy. And the biggest feeling, I guess I could say, is relief because our races are so close. So I had just been on the line so many times, just pinched out of a, a top placing. And it was a great affirmation for me that uh, was a result that felt like it was a confirmation of, of the work I put in that I deserved, yeah. 2012 Boston Marathon, another big one for you. Yeah. Tell me about that race and, and you know the training leading up to it mm-hmm. and the actual day. Yeah, so, so Boston. So that came after that tough period that I had just talked about. So it was a month and a half of winter training that I felt I had lost. And then having to switch when I was healthy again, thinking, all right, instead of looking at the training I lost, I got a month and a half left. I got to make this the best training I've ever had. And like I said, it was it was with the motivation for training for this girl for the London Marathon, which was six days later. <laughs> so Boston was supposed to be the warm up. And I got out there and I, and I always knew it would be a good course for me. And I'd only done it two or three times in a, a while before. And yeah, I found myself with the course record holder, just him and I, the first five or 10, 10K. And then I was off on my own for the rest of the race. And it was just me focused and in, in my zone. And yeah, it's funny. The, the races in a, in a sport where it's so close, where even after 42 kilometers, we have eight guys crossing two seconds, like a split. It's It's nothing these races that I've won, I've won by a lot. <laughs> so it seems when everything goes right, it really goes right. Um, so it was pretty exciting. I, I, I remember getting to the top of Heartbreak Hill, looking at my clock and thinking, if I, I don't know what the record is, it's 118 something, but I know if I, if I do a best time, I'm going to get close to it. So I just gave everything and yeah, across the line and I didn't find out until the trophy ceremony that I got the record for sure and yeah that that's the the pinnacle pinnacle moment of my career so far for sure fastest marathon in a wheelchair yes yeah one eighteen twenty five was was the time and uh it actually just this past year it says five six years just got broken by a couple of seconds so I have some motivation to go and get it back now Absolutely. <laughs> yeah yeah what, what did you have for breakfast that morning I do remember because uh, <laughs> because I won, so I you know you take notes. That, yeah. yeah, it was barely nothing. I I had a banana. I had a couple of bites of oatmeal, like maybe four or five spoonfuls, literally. And I think I had a like a nut bar of some sort, and I believe that was it. I hydrated right. I probably had a shot of coffee, or I think back then I probably had a Red Bull or something, <laughs> and. Yeah, it was I, I had proper nutrition and hydration leading all up. But that morning, I just didn't want to feel too heavy. And yeah, that's what I did. <laughs> do, you, do you have superstitions that, you know, if something goes right the one race, you're going to try and do everything exactly the same the next time and the next time? Well, it's always, I mean, if you have success, you want to try and replicate it. But, you know, the funny thing is, is it's hard to sometimes pinpoint. You know, yeah. I looked at my training I did. And the following two years replicated that exactly. My numbers, because I log all this stuff in my journal, was was better. Like session for session leading up, I was in better shape than the year that I won. And then just different weather conditions, different day, and didn't win wasn't near the time yeah. right so um so you always look at those things and that's that's the whole point of the game and that's what makes it fun too is figuring out what works and and what doesn't and what's you know you know figuring out what is concrete and and you know <laughs> etc you know the life i think of a paralympic athlete and an olympic athlete 
it can be a very challenging one because you you're training for these events they happen every four years mm -hmm. so you're visualizing something that is often years away mm -hmm. the moment comes it's it's a very short span of time yeah and then you have to live with the result for another four years yeah. uh, what is that like uh well that's definitely how this past one rio felt the rio just felt like a weird game it's like a it was a tough year financially i, I didn't have things equipment training competitions camps lead up that i had wanted but again you just instead of letting it weigh you down you got to let it go let it go let it go I, everything's happening as it should get there and those races were just all funny they those ones truly felt like they were over in a flash the result wasn't what I expected, and it just left a weird feeling, which ultimately had me deciding that I wanted to go to the next ones, that I wasn't going to leave on, on that note. But it's, it's a pretty crazy experience, and, and like you said, four years before the next one, and that's what the world sees. And London was a big lesson for me in 2012 because, you know, we race all the time. I mean, I could be gone from home. I could never come home in a year if I, if I just hit up all the races. And nobody sees those those ones in comparison. There are very few that follow the whole year of the sport, right? So in general with Olympic and Paralympic sport. Mm -hmm. So so London was another example of, you know, I was pushing equal to records, world records, the week before the Games. Got sick with a bacteria infection the week of the Games and didn't even make the finals that I was I was ranked top five favorite to medal in and so it was that letting go or it was having to take that pressure off that yeah i gotta wait four years for that next moment but that three minutes doesn't define me that was one week out of the last four years so it really instilled just the process of, of everything that that we all do is more important that journey than than the end because even after winning all the medals or losing it's still a moment past yeah. and and what defines us more is what we're doing every day and and so that's really what i took home from that yeah yeah i think you really have to embody that and live that more than a lot of a lot of people yeah. do that that relishing of the the process and, and mm -hmm. the moment you've mentioned that on a wheelchair in a race you've clocked somewhere close to 80 kilometers an hour at one point or another yeah I think it's 85, I think. 85 yeah. kilometers an hour. And, and I know what it's like to go maybe 60 on a bicycle, uh -huh. but to go that fast, to be in a wheelchair exposed to that as you're going that fast, what is that feeling like? Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's uh, scary. It's a little nerve-wracking, too, because at that speed, I mean, you, you're, if you hit a pothole or something, there's nothing you can do about it. So, yeah, it's an exhilarating speed, and you're actually holding on so tightly to the steering to make sure it stays straight and locked and wind gusts aren't pushing you anywhere. So, yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's a rush. What is the steering like? It's just purely uh, left wheel, right wheel, or is it, how does it kind of work? So there's a there's a steering on the front, which is free for the road for you to take the, the bigger turns. Um, there's a secondary track steering, which is like a locked steering, which you set to the curve of the track. So when you get up to the track, you hit the steering once, it locks to the curve, keep pushing, hit the steering again when you get to the straight, so you're not trying to steer and push at the same time. And then just the minor shifts are all just slight body Weird. movement yeah. yeah and then the wheels you're you're hammering both the wheels at the same time and it's like a punching action because they're going so fast on the flat will be 35 36 kilometers an hour close to 40 so on those instances i mean your wheels are going so fast that you're just you're just hitting them trying to keep the momentum going so it's quite different yeah brake mechanisms on there yeah the brakes uh the brakes is a front brake same as bike brake but after about 50 kilometers an hour, I mean, it's not going to do much. <laughs> yeah. If it's only in the front, is there, is there any danger? Or is it the way the wheelchair, a uh, racing wheelchair, you're not going to flip over from, from hitting yeah, the front brakes? No, not unless, no, it would take a pothole to flip. Yeah. Um, because we're such low center of gravity, there's never a fear or worry of that. It's more just you're going so fast that if you lock on the brakes so tightly, I mean, after 50 kilometers an hour you'll just probably you can lock up the wheel and then just yeah. blow a tire and keep <laughs> skidding so <laughs> yeah when it comes to your sport is there is there sort of a i don't, I don't know if shelf life is quite the right word but yeah. compared to you know a usain bolt he's got x many games and then he's not going to be able to compete anymore mm -hmm. 
how long can you realistically continue to compete in games and you know and continue to give it another shot another shot sure uh for our sport for wheelchair racing the peak age seems to be late 20s early 30s there are still you know young prodigies that come up that are are doing well at a very early age and then the same on the other end for the distance events i think we had like five of the top 10 ranked guys uh, in the marathon were 40 like around 40 years old yeah years of that yeah Yeah. so if i wanted to for the for the marathon i could go more but you know i'm I'm just i'm focused on tokyo right now and um, i'm 32 right now so so i'll still be in peak years for for the track and yeah after all these competitions all these races how many countries has this this passion of yours taken you to oh a lot i don't have a number but yeah it's taken me to so many countries so many great places that uh yeah really appreciative sometimes you know it's a fly in compete stay to your hotel room to get rest and then go and and the most you see is the trip to the airport but there are some training camps and things where you get some time and and it's uh it's great to get that exposure to the world for sure you know energy is a big thing for you and this idea that we're connected i think um being somebody who's able to go around the world and meet people from all these different places, Mm -hmm. how that's influenced you. Tell me about how that's shaped you in this, this notion of how we are really so connected. Yeah, well, I think, you know, growing up being a, I guess you would say a minority, someone with a physical disability, um, you know, having compassion for others is something obviously it was taught too, but something that was instilled at an early age for people and their differences. And, you know, I just wish kids at such an early age could travel and 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 see other cultures and get exposed to that to to take away judgment and have some you know more understanding for other people and and that there isn't always necessarily a right way it's just a different way and with our internet world and with being anywhere in the globe just a plane flight away that's what the immigration shock is right now with many nations is is you know this clash of cultures and exposure but the kids are the ones that are doing great with it you know you look in these schools and with the right surroundings i mean most of these kids are you know it's great that they're getting this cultural exposure now because it's just going to lead to more harmony and understanding Right, like you said, because we're all connected. <laughs> it's like a, yeah, I mean, at that age, it's hey, you like soccer? I like soccer. Yeah. Let's go play. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's none of that. It was a pretty process. cool thing I saw recently, and it was uh, it was two kids. I think they were five or six years old, and uh, <laughs> and one cut his hair short to be like his friend because he wanted to trick his teacher to get the, her confused as to who is who. And there's just this adorable picture of they've got these two little these two little buddies have their arms around each other with the same short haircut and the one is white and the other one's black and and they're just like <laughs> laughing because they think they're fooling their teacher right and that's like that's the perspective and it's just yeah. you know it's really cool to see beyond your athletic endeavors mm-hmm. you're an illustrator as well mm-hmm. uh have just not too long ago released a project mm-hmm. can you tell me about that yeah, so it's a graphic novel that I've been working on since back in my university days that I put on the back burner to focus on <laughs> on the racing. So yeah, so I've just gotten back at that. So it's been, it's like a three part graphic novel series and yeah i just announced it to to, to pre-launch and get word out there and, and get things going i'm hoping aiming to have it uh, out for this winter so so yeah so i'm really excited about it art's the other equal passion of mine and you know the olympic dream job on that side is getting to work with marvel or dc comics mm-hmm. and in 2009 i i was in the final stages of getting to do work with marvel and i had to pull out of that process to uh focus on racing and and it was a tough decision so so this year i'm getting some more balance back and yeah getting to some of those things that i've been dying to do so you're a huge fan of comics then too growing up oh yeah yeah got oh. a huge stash in that room oh. <laughs> who who or which was the the comic uh, book that you followed the most um well i always loved you know i i love the popular ones uh, i love wolverine and daredevil and spider-man were my my three favorites growing up but uh you know i love the x-men in general obviously you know being again a minority and you know identifying with those stories or uh or daredevil you know it was just it was you know really cool having this guy where his 
quote-unquote disability was just overshadowed by his abilities, right? right? So a lot of those stories really resonated with me at an early age. <laughs> I imagine, well, I know, being a, a Paralympic athlete, your competitive fire is strong. <laughs> How do you intend to replace that when the time comes when you eventually stop competing in, in these yeah. races? Uh, f- well, f- for me, I don't really find that. It's always just there, and my problem is always just... I've got too many things I want to do that I'm excited to do, so that won't change. That same fire will go into my creative stuff that I, you know, the writing and music and the artwork. So yeah, so I'm excited for that, but I'm I'm kind of just having a bit of balance right now to get back in touch with that because I think that's important for myself and who I am too. And then I mean, and then I'll be really head down, just focused on on athletics for the lead up to Tokyo, and and um, yeah, I'm really excited about it too. How badly do you want to get on that podium in Tokyo? <laughs> badly. I you know I've won a lot of medals, but that's the one that I'm missing is that Paralympic medal. So, you know, it's it's interesting because as you get older, you know, you're not young and a bunch of fire in your belly with, you know, nothing to lose, everything to prove. It's more just for myself and, and something I want to do and see if I can at this stage. And, and having the past games not turn out the way I want, has put fire back in me and it's great seeing young guys come up too that always puts a little bit of fire back in you and at this stage I just have so much experience that I'm so grateful for but yeah it's it's just important at at this stage to remember to have fun again because after a while sometimes the fun gets taken out of it when you get pressure and and uh you know all these other external factors going on right so yeah so I'm really looking forward to this this chapter thanks a lot Josh it's been a pleasure thank you very much yeah That's it for the show. Thanks for listening, and I hope you liked it. If you want to know more about Josh, or if you're interested in hearing him speak at your event or business, head to his website, joshcassidy.com. He's also on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Just search Josh Cassidy 84 If you like the show, you can do me a huge favor by subscribing. It's on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, YouTube, and Player.fm. You can also leave a rating and review. That makes a big difference. Or pass it along to someone else you think will like it. The music for the show is by Dr. Turtle off the album You Um, I'll Ah. I'm Martin Bauman, and this was A Story Untold. See you next time. (laughs) 